growing up in Fiji, I've always known the value of the oceans. But to study environmental law, it was not in the books for me, but I always wanted to become a lawyer. I had no idea at all that there were any sort of laws regulating activities to do with our environment or the use of our natural resources. When I was in law school, that actually got me thinking. I've always known that our ancestors played a great role in the way we live, you know, traditionally as a people of the oceans. When I came to work for IUCN, I was actually given a responsibility to do research around marine protected areas. And so this really got me looking at challenges that Pacific Islanders are facing. And I'm here at the United Nations with a team from IUCN to provide scientific and technical legal advice to those negotiating the biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions treaty. The treaty is an internationally legally binding agreement that focuses on the conservation and sustainable use of our marine biodiversity um, in the high seas. Geopolitics has no place in how we manage our shared global ocean comets. We're the first one to go because our islands are low-lying. So, of course, we're the one worried the most. You guys living on the high land, some of you deny the existence of global warming because you never go outside. The high seas are two-thirds of the ocean. The high seas are all the ocean that is after what we call national jurisdiction. The high seas are open to all states, um, but there are certain rights and obligations that go along with that. And part of the problem is that states have not been complying with these obligations. The treaty is important because it focuses on an area of our oceans that none of the current international legal frameworks really protects or conserves. This treaty is important because it aims to regulate some forms of human activities on the high seas. The treaty covers area-based management tools. It covers marine genetic resources, including access and benefit sharing. It includes environment impact assessment. It also includes capacity building and transfer of marine technology. This treaty will help fight climate change if it helps preserve biodiversity. Biodiversity and marine ecosystems uh, sequester carbon from the atmosphere. By cycling it through food web, that's one of our best ways to capture atmospheric carbon. The BBNJ Treaty started 17 years ago. 17 years ago, I was six years old, and now I'm here, still not having a treaty to protect our high seas, um, and I'm 23 years old. The biggest challenge is really galvanizing ongoing political support and enthusiasm about the high seas treaty and making sure that there's an appropriate infusion of funding to support all the institutional mechanisms we're going to need. We need to address these challenges now. What we can do is get everybody on board, bring the finance toad to the table, bring science and conservation, integrate traditional knowledge, have all the stakeholders around and get started. It's common sense. Uh, people need to be good to the ocean because without the ocean, we all die. And what happens out there in the high seas comes to us and happens here too. And there's no boundary in between. So we must be good steward, like I always say, because what happens there, it happens here too. We need to be optimists. it would be the beginning of something good. We need to immediately lighten our footprint. If we give the treaty some teeth, some ability to adopt decisions independently, we might be in a, in a planet with more protected areas in the high seas.
I'd like to say that we desperately need a high seas treaty established in order to prevent、um, more problematic human activities such as overfishing and pollution, which has been affecting and depleting our marine life.